Washington Journal continues. We're back and we'll continue our discussion here about a health care vote with Representative Jan Schakowsky, Democrat of Illinois. She also was a member of the National Debt and Deficit Commission. Uh, but we'll begin with health care and talk sure. about the debate kicked off yesterday on the floor. Republicans came out with their own report um, saying that the law will cause companies to not hire new employees because they fear their health care costs will be too high. They say this will create a loss of $650,000 jobs, which will damage the economy. They also say the law will lead to lower wages to make up for taxes and fees employers must pay. What's your response? Well, actually, the, the bill is very friendly to small business in particular and giving a, a large number of tax breaks that allow them to be able to afford health insurance for their employees. The current system is really the one that is employer unfriendly. Um, I had a press conference yesterday and a business uh, man who has 15 employees said that his insurance goes up double digit every year because he has one employee that is 62 years old with a pre-existing condition. They can't change health insurance policies because otherwise he would not be employed. But um, what, what they also find is that it's unfair in some ways to all the other employees. They understand because they want this person to stay employed. But now we have situations where employees have to look at a potential hire and think, hmm, am I going to be able to afford that person not because they're not good at the job or the best person for the job, but they may have a pre-existing condition. What about larger employers, though, the, the big companies, if, if it's the case that they're concerned about their overall health costs? And what confidence do you have? I mean, how, what's your counter argument to Republicans saying, or your data, your proof, that 650,000 jobs will be lost? Well, actually, if you look right now at the increase in employment, it's really in the, the health sector that this is the burgeoning industry right now because we are going to be adding 32 million people to be able to be in, insured right now. Um, and, and that's uh, rolling in even as we speak. There's so many benefits right now for people that will make more people be able to get health care. But large em employers right now can keep the policies that, that they have. It's not going to change. But what what does happen is if uh, a, a person um, is unaffordable, they can go into a health exchange in 2014. It will actually, this is helpful to employers because there will be a fallback position for employees to go into a, uh, a health exchange. All private insurance, you know, I, I heard the, uh, my, my former, co my new colleague, um, who was just on the show saying that there's less uh, freedom with this new plan. Actually, it frees people up from the demands of the insurance industry that makes decisions on who to insure, how much to charge them, what benefits are going to be covered. That applies to employers as well as private insurance companies. A lot of discussion as well, a lot of back and forth about how much it's going to cost the, bill, the new law versus repealing it, how much that will cost. The budget chairman, Paul Ryan, Republican in Wisconsin, was on the floor yesterday talking about the cost. Here's what he had to say. This health care law, if left in place, will accelerate our country's path toward bankruptcy. This health care law, if left in place, will do as the president's own chief actuary says will do, will increase health care costs. We are already seeing premiums go up across the board. We're already hearing from thousands of employers across the country who are talking about dropping their employer-sponsored health insurance. And we're already hearing from the lack of choices that consumers will get as this new law is put into place. This new law is a fiscal house of cards, and it is a health care house of cards. It does not make our health care system better. I would argue it makes it weaker. We believe we can get to the moment of having affordable health care for every American, regardless of pre-existing conditions, without having the government take it over, without a trillion dollars of a combination of Medicare benefit cuts and tax increases. We believe in this. Let's have health care reform put the patient in charge, not the government in charge. Congresswoman, your reaction. 
Well, he is just wrong on so many fronts. The Congressional Budget Office, which all of us agreed on the Fiscal Commission, which Paul Ryan was on, would be the standard. We would all agree with this nonpartisan, independent analyst, says that actually repealing the health care bill will cost $230 billion over the next 10 years and $1.4 trillion over the next 20 years. But this whole idea of somehow putting government in charge, we have to get rid of that notion. Right now, the insurance insurance industry is in charge. And so many people are left out because the insurance companies decide if you get sick, for example, and you have insurance, that they can cancel that insurance. Those are called rescissions. The new bill says that they can't do that anymore. If you have a child, God forbid, with a brain tumor or diabetes, the health insurance companies can say no. We're not going to insure that child. Too expensive. The bill right now says that children with pre-existing conditions can get health care. A 24-year-old who has a job but doesn't have health insurance can now stay on his parents' policies. And seniors who can't afford their drugs right now are going to be able to get help under this, this new bill. And that is why, under new polling, uh, the APG. GRF poll, I don't know what GRF is, <laughs> um, uh, says that 62% of Americans actually support the, uh, the health care reform as it is or want it expanded. And only one in four, the poll says, re support repealing health care uh, reform entirely. Many of the people who oppose the, the bill think it doesn't go far enough. We're the only country in the world that doesn't say that our citizens, our people, deserve to have health care. And I would venture to say that there isn't anyone in America who would say, if somebody gets uh, in, a, in a car accident, critically injured, we don't treat those people like roadkill, regardless of their insurance. We take them to the hospital. If they're uninsured, guess who pays for it? We pay for it. It increases our health care costs every year. I'm talking about individual ratepayers premium payers will see that cost added to their bill at least $1,000 a year. The Baltimore Sun is featuring a new poll by Gallup that shows 46% of those surveyed do want it repealed and only 40% want the law to stand. Well, there are, there are a number of different, different polls. Um, I, I would agree. But if you ask people about the specifics of the legislation, people support most of the specifics that, that that are provided by the bill. And, and, and many people would, would agree, and I think Democrats would agree, fine, you don't like this provision or that provision, why don't we sit down as a Congress and go through the bill and decide how we can make it better. What areas do you see uh, that, that, that uh, both sides could compromise on? Well, there's uh, what's called a 1099 provision for businesses that I think everyone across the board agrees is burdensome for for businesses that we should that we should repeal, um, but w we haven't had that conversation. They don't want that conversation, and you know Dick Army and Fred Upton, who's now chairman of the Energy and Commerce Com Co Committee, um, have both said, "Well, repeal can happen now, but it could take years. It could take a long time to make the improvements that American people want." And we are. The, uh, of all the rich countries in, in the world, we have more uh, um, preventable deaths in the United States of America. And here's one. Um, Midge, who was at a press conference with me yesterday, told her the story of her daughter-in-law, who died, uh, just, and her unborn child died, because she had a pre-existing condition. And you know what it was? Pregnancy. She had had another child. And this is not uncommon, that in health insurance policies, a prior pregnancy will be considered a pre-existing condition. By the time they mobilized the health care she needed, Jennifer died, leaving a two-year-old child. This is wrong in the United States of America. Let's go to phone calls. Fred, a Republican in Toledo, Ohio. You're on the air. Hi, good morning. Thank you for C-SPAN. Um, I get a little nervous when I get through, but... Uh, if you give me just a second to try to get my point through, um, you know, when they first of all, I'm in favor of health insurance for everyone. Um, I just lost my insurance back in November. Um, I couldn't afford the sixteen thousand dollars a year I was paying for Cobra. 
um, and I'm not eligible for Medicare until May. Um, so my point is, though, when I think about, you know, I, I don't think that they should repeal this bill. I think they should reform it, just like the, the representative was saying. I totally agree, and I'm a Republican, like I said. Um, but my point, well, my point was, Colin, is when they when you look at the fraud that's involved. Um, I know that I know that my prescriptions are very expensive, um, but I also know, I know, say, just even if it was only a half a dozen people that 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 go to doctors, get prescriptions, and sell them on the street, which I I don't do. Um, but if you took just those people alone and their doctors that that give it, you know, more or less give it to them because Medicaid. Medicare almost pays, well, I don't know about Medicare, but Medicaid pays for all of it. Even if you had 2 million people frauding the government and insurance companies out of $10,000 a year, the, the savings would be astronomical. All right. Go ahead. Well, I, I appreciate your, your comment. I, I wish you good luck and just point out that Medicare will certainly help. I wish you the, the best, certainly, until, until May. Uh, when you will be able to get the advantage of uh, the Medicare program. Um, but one of the things that we did in the legislation was really beef up the fraud detection, the fraud and abuse detection to take out the, uh, the, the, the money that, we, that is wasted. I have to tell you, Fred, that a lot of that, unfortunately, is in the provider sector where um, various uh, providers will charge Medicare, will charge Medicaid, for more money than is actually spent. That's really more fraud than individuals. And that, that is a terrible situation if people go out and they, and they sell their, their drugs. But of course, what we end up with is people um, right now who can't afford their medication or divide it in half, medication share, prescription drug share, that happens among the, the elderly. And of course, that can lead to serious diseases that put people in hospitals and cost the government and you even more. So good luck to you. Next phone call, Memphis, Tennessee, Ruth, a Democrat. Morning, Ruth. Good morning. I think it is so critically important that we refer to this as a law and not a bill. And I want to say that to the representative and to all sorts of news Thank moderators. You. I appreciate C-SPAN. Um, this is a law. It took us 75 to 100 years to get it passed. The Republican representative kept saying, this is excellent. We, don't, we like this part. We like this part. We like this part. If this were repealed, it might take us another 100 years to get the parts that all Americans like passed again. It cannot be repealed. It can be modified. You know, I really appreciate that. If I use the word bill, you make an excellent point. Because it's one thing to have a debate in Congress about a bill. But now we're at the point that if Republicans go for repeal, they're taking away things people already have. And as you said, um, you know, do we really want to do this to children, to seniors, to small businesses, take away benefits they have right now under this law, the Affordable Care Act? So thanks for that point. And, but the, the reality is this is not going to be repealed because the Senate has already said they're not even going to take up this um, legislation to repeal the new health care law. Republicans will then, in the House, go to the committee level and try to uh, go after the new law piece by piece. What are you expecting um, from the committees? Well, you know, we'll, we'll see, first of all, what the attitude is about the, uh, the, the vote on, on repeal, um, if they're hearing from their constituents about, about that vote. Because I actually believe that a vote to repeal is not going to end up being uh, a positive. I don't know if that'll be in the long run or in the, in the short term. Um, but, but yes, I think that there, there will be section by section repeals, and, um, and there may be some where we agree. My, here's my hope. My hope is that uh, if repeal passes in the House but goes nowhere, that we actually can have that conversation that has been postponed about ways to improve the legislation. That's a possibility, too. Nan, here with our previous guest, new freshman Republican member, um, said that Republicans would like to open up uh, insurance across state lines, uh, expand health savings accounts, 
and have a marketplace model for pricing. Open to those three things? Look, the marketplace model has been, has been the, the model. And what we're seeing are insurance companies gouging consumers. I really challenge anyone out there to call and say that the rate increases have been reasonable. Finally, we have a situation under this bill that says that 80 cents of every dollar now has to be spent on insuring health care, not on CEO profits, not on management and, and overhead and, uh, and bonuses to the uh, executives. Um, and, and so the, the kinds of solutions that they're providing, again, put insurance companies in the driver's seat. We've seen what happens with that. This bill controls that. Put some rules of the road. It's still private insurance. They can still make money, but we set some rules of the road. Let's go to Eric, a Republican in Greensboro, North Carolina. Thanks for waiting, Eric. Hey, thank you. You're on the I've air, got, sir. I have got about four questions to ask you if it will be all right. Well, Eric, we're going to have to have you pick one or two because we need to get some more voices in here. Okay, we'll pick two. All right. First of all, on this help form. On, on what form? Uh, we're going to talk. First, I picked two questions. First on health form, this started back in the Bush era. Okay, sir, we're listening. Can you quickly get to your question? Yes. I think they ought to leave the bill like it is. I'm a Republican. I am on Social Security, me and my wife both. We both draw together $1,500 a month. Tough. Since they stopped the raise on, disabil on disability, we have not got a raise in three years. But I have to make house payments, and I, my health is bad. I had three CT scans in the last four months that cost me right at $3,000 a piece. All right, Eric, what's your question? My question is, why don't they quit arguing in Washington and get together and go through this plan and get it worked out so the public can see what's going on? All right, Congresswoman. Well, uh, you know, I completely agree with you, Eric, and I, and I want to say that um, I also fear that there's, uh, first of all, I agree with you that the lack of increase in the Social Security COLA has been a real burden for older Americans, and I think that's a problem. But I also fear that we're going to see from the Republicans suggestions that Social Security and Medicare get cut even further, and we're going to have to mobilize um, to, to make sure that that doesn't happen, because what we're seeing is a disappearing middle class in this country and, and poor people really being hurt. Health care, number one, I think, is, the, is the, the, the problem that is driving personal bankruptcies and, uh, and, and premature deaths in this country. And uh, we, you're right. We, I am hoping that what we'll do is sit down, work it out, come up with, a, uh, with improvements to the bill, not repeal it. Memphis, Tennessee. Robert, Democratic Line. Good morning. Yes. I want to make a comment. I'm, I'm a living witness of what the, what the senator is saying, that they do take your insurance away from you when you get sick. I, had, I have cancer, and I paid for my employer where I worked at on my job. I paid this company for 12 to 13 years. And the minute that I got sick with this cancer, which is a very rare cancer, they paid up until about nine or ten months of my treatment. And then after that, they cut me off and wouldn't give me a reason why. But just thank God that I was 66 years old and was able to get on Medicare and Medicaid and Social Security. All right. That's Robert, a Democrat in Memphis, Tennessee. What's your reaction, Congresswoman? Well, first of all, I, I, I wish him well. But this is the United States of America. You must have been thinking about that. How could this happen in our richest country in the world? 
that a person like you, someone who has worked hard, has stayed with your employer, now is left to fend for yourself with, with, uh, without health care coverage or, or scrimping and saving and, 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 and maybe not even being able to pay for it. I ran into a number of people who can't, no matter what they do, afford the health care they need. That's why we need this, uh, this legislation. I wish you the best. Another vote uh, coming up is uh, whether or not to raise the debt ceiling. Pat Toomey, the new senator from Pennsylvania, Republican, writes in the Wall Street Journal today that, in fact, if Congress refuses to raise the debt ceiling, the federal government will still have far more than enough money to fully service our debt. Next year, for instance, about 6.5 percent of all projected federal government expenditures will go to interest on our debt, and tax revenue is projected to cover about 67 percent of all government expenditures, with roughly 10 10 times more income than needed to honor our debt obligations, why would we ever default? To make absolutely sure, he says, I intend to introduce legislation that would require the Treasury to make interest payments on our debt its first priority in the event that the debt ceiling is not raised. That would not only ensure the continued confidence of investors at home and abroad, but would enable us to have an honest debate about the consequences of our eventual decision about the debt ceiling. Well, I, I, I'm shocked that he would uh, propose something like that, and I would uh, question, he writes it in the Wall Street Journal, whether the markets would really um, think that's a good idea to start fooling around with the full faith and credit of the uh, United States of America. Um, you know, the debt ceiling has been raised under every president um, with, without fooling around with, with that. It's another matter to talk about how to deal with the, 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 the deficit or the long-term debt. But to, uh, and, and frankly, I think that the, uh, the president should, uh, should, should not, and the, and the Congress should not be held hostage to arguments like that but that we should do the responsible thing, the adult thing to do. Most Republicans, I believe, agree with that. And then we should, uh, you know, look at the question of the, uh, of the debt. Is the data accurate, though, that he cites, that we're uh, still able to pay our debts? I, I, I don't know. But the, the, the idea of that we should leave all other uh, expenditures, what, it, what is he saying? We, we should stop with any kind of uh, a, a building of roads or providing job training or medical research. Everything should be stopped. All other spending should be stopped in order to pay the debt. That's not responsible either. I have no idea if his numbers are accurate. I know his position is marginal. Another uh, piece this morning in the Wall Street Journal, the op-ed page is written by Dick Armey and Matt Keeby, the uh, Tea Party group, What Congress Should Cut. And they advocate, um, uh, put forth what uh, Cato has put forth, um, a 10-year Cato spending cut. Uh, advocates scrapping the Departments of Commerce and, and Housing and Urban Development. That saves $550 billion. Ending farm subsidies would produce nearly $290 billion. Cutting NASA spending would, uh, by 50 percent would save $90 billion. Repealing Davis-Bacon labor rules produces $60 billion. And ending urban mass transit grants would save about $52 billion. You know, a, a number of, of these uh, I would be willing to look at some of the, the farm subsidies, and I did in my own proposal for how to reduce the debt. But you know, the debt is one problem we have to deal with. The other problem we have to deal with is that this, this disappearing middle class, the growing disparity between particularly the super rich and the rest of America. And this exacerbates it. If you start cutting programs that help middle class people, like housing and urban development, then I think we're going to make the problem worse and we are going to see an erosion, a further erosion of middle income people who are already, we've, we've seen a massive transfer of wealth to the top 1% that controls 34% of the wealth in this country, more than the 90% of Americans who only control about 29 percent. This gap is a danger to our democracy as well as our economy. Proposals like that exacerbate it. Let's go to uh, Ron, an independent in Colts Neck, New Jersey. You're on the air. Uh, good morning. Uh, I've got a couple comments on two areas this morning, please. Uh, one, on the uh, health bill, I wish that, you know, 2,500 pages, I wish somebody would go through it and explain it so that that I could understand it because I can't read it myself and understand it as to what's really in there. Two, um, January 1st of this of 2010, uh, my son, who is 
was 22 at the time, was also disabled, uh, was cut from Blue Cross of New Jersey because they did it because I guess they didn't want to wait till September when they couldn't do it. And uh, also, uh, in the middle of a, of a contract year, and I've been with Blue Cross for 25 years, they raised my rate 60%. On the uh, second area, talking about all these people with businesses that are whining and crying, I was self-employed from like the mid-80s to 2001 when I got sick and forced to leave my business. Tax rates were higher then. I paid all my insurance for all my employees because I felt that that was the right thing to do. People just don't seem to have a conscience today as to a moral conscience, which is the right things to do for your employees. And I believe it, you know, it all came back to me. And, you know, they make such a big deal over this that people aren't going to hire. That didn't stop me from hiring people if I needed people. If I had more business and I needed more people, that was good for me. All right, Ron, we have to leave it there. And, uh, Congressman, if we get a, a quick reply from you, uh, we are expecting here shortly okay. the arrival of Hu Jin, uh, Jintao at the White House. So go ahead. Uh, first of all, you should be able to get your son on your policy, both his age um, qualifies him and because um, I, I believe because of the the pre-existing condition that he he can no longer be denied check check that out but I agree with your statement that this is really a moral issue the United States of America no one should go bankrupt no one should have to die because they don't have health they, they can't have access to health care Thank you. Congresswoman Chikowski thanks so much for being here come back again soon we didn't get enough time with you this morning thank We'd you like to so have much. You back. I'd like to. Thank All you. Right.